we continue our series of messages on spiritual leadership looking at the book of Judges. We have covered three of the judges and we have looked at their example and how each of them illustrates a different aspect of spiritual leadership. We looked at Othniel, the leader of righteous heritage, the idea that growing up with righteous heritage is a blessing in and of itself. Now notice I didn't say religious heritage. I said righteous heritage. And righteous heritage has to do with the investment of righteousness in the hearts and lives of those who we consider to be our friends or family members. To leave a legacy of true righteousness is better than any legacy you can leave in this life. And that is what Othniel had. And God used that as a means of raising him up as a spiritual leader. We then looked at Ehud, the one who had the opposite. He didn't really have a good heritage. In fact, his tribe was not necessarily noted because they had failed in terms of following through on God's will. But God raised him up to redeem the name of his tribe and also to redeem the nation. And that tells us that it doesn't matter what your upbringing has been. It doesn't matter what has been the failure within your family or any other circle. God can use you, can raise you up to make a difference in your generation. Last week we looked at Shamgar, one verse about this guy who may not have even been Jewish. He had no particular background to speak of, but it is someone whom God raised up to be a judge of resource. God made this man use a farmer's tool to defeat 600 Philistines. Why? Because all God wants from us to use us is availability and courage. You don't need to have a heritage. All you need is to have a heart for God. And God can always use that to deliver his people and to use you to be a blessing to his people. This week, we look at one of my favorite judges, the prophetic judge, and her name is Deborah. Let's pray. Father, in these few moments, teach us what it means to be a prophetic spiritual leader through the life of Deborah, in Jesus' name, amen. Notice I emphasized her, because this is unprecedented. Up to this point, every leader, both spiritual and national in Israel has been a man. But God rose up this woman named Deborah to be a leader for a nation that did not have precedent for her before. Now, we see a vicious cycle going on with the Israelites if you haven't seen it yet. This is what is happening every generation. The people of Israel do what is evil in the sight of God. They get overrun by their enemies in the territory. They cry out to God saying, God, please help us. God answers them and sends a deliverer who delivers them from their enemies. They go through a time of peace. Then the deliverer dies. And then they go back to doing what is wrong in the eyes of God. And the cycle continues. It continues. We saw it with Othniel, we saw it with Ehud, we see it again with Shamgar. And the passage of scripture in Judges chapter 4 starts the same way. The people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud died. Israel is having a problem being righteous without a righteous example. So God raises up these righteous people, Israel follows them, follows their example of righteousness, but as soon as they die, Israel goes right back into the same old, same old, and the cycle repeats itself. If you will read the history of Israel all the way through to King Saul and King David, the same thing even happens when they desire to have a human king. They think to themselves, if we have a human king, then our nation is going to prosper and we will always be delivered from our enemies. But guess what? The human kings, they die too. And as soon as the human kings die, the cycle begins all over again. 
You see, that, my friend, is the reason why Jesus Christ is the solution to the sin problem. Because in Jesus, we have a leader that will never die. Hallelujah. We have a leader who is not built around the human capacity to follow an individual. We have a leader who lives within us, guiding us and directing us into righteousness. And even when we die, his work continues in the hearts and lives of those who know him. Why? Because he is a true spiritual leader and guide for our souls. Human beings, even human kings will die, but Jesus Christ will never die. We thank God for that reality in our lives. And this is the reason why he is the answer to the cycle of sin and its natural consequences. So now we are on to Deborah. And I want to point this out. Israel is a patriarchal society for multiple reasons. The first reason is because God is the father of the nation. And so the people, they look to God and their idea of God is that of a father. And in a sense, they model the idea of leadership based on their view and understanding of God. And so up to this point in Israel's history, men have been the leaders. Men are the ones who have guided them out of, of, of bondage and into the promised land. Men have been the ones who have been raised up by him to deliver them out of the hands of enemies. And for the average Israelite, the idea is, if you're not a man, then you're just there to support the leadership of men. And you know, it's so funny that uh, history has a way of repeating itself. Wherever there is an insecurity and a misunderstanding about true leadership, people try to force leadership upon others. And they force it based on brute force and strength. But guess what, my friend? Every single person, man and woman, has been created in the image of God. And because of that, you not only have the dignity which comes from being a child of God and being someone created in the image of God, you have the ability through God to lead if he has raised you up for that purpose, whether you are a man or a woman. You know, I've heard it so many times throughout scripture that God is chauvinist and that God is interested in only the leadership of men and women are isolated to more of a supportive role. But as you can see right here in the scriptures, in an early example of the way God works, God raises up women just as he raises up men to serve as leaders. But I can well imagine, in a society that is patriarchal, Deborah may have been someone that was, there may have been some kind of scrutiny of her as a leader. I can well imagine that there are men saying, I cannot go to this woman and have this woman judge between the affairs of me and God and me and my fellow man. But here we are going to see that when God calls you to purpose, he will also give you what you need for that service. And let's be clear, my friends. When God works, it is clear that he is the one that is at work. And no man can stop what God is doing when he has placed his hand upon a life now, she's an unusual leader. Most of the judges so far are raised up to be military leaders. They go ahead and they fight against the enemy and they win and Israel is set free. But Deborah has a different role. And this is also important in our understanding of spiritual leadership. You see, spiritual leadership doesn't always look the same. And it doesn't always function in the same way. Deborah was not called to be a warrior, to be someone who fights for Israel, but she was called to raise up the warriors that would be used for the deliverance of the people. And that, my friends, is just as valuable in the eyes of God as the one who pulls the sword and fights the battle. In God's eyes, the prophet, the one who gives vision to the people, the one who gives insight to the people about the will of God is just as important as the one who goes out into the field and does the work. Why? Because without vision, the people perish. 
And the prophet or the prophetess is the one who gives the vision so that the people may understand what it is that God has them to do. And this is a wonderful reality of Deborah. And what I love about her is she is doing something unprecedented. She is doing something that the nation has never seen. And she is doing it from a heart that is full of commitment to God. And God is convincing the people around her that he has called her to this role. I want to talk about three things that we see in the life of Deborah. And hopefully as we look at these things in the context, we will learn what it means to be a prophetic spiritual leader. And hopefully if God has called you to that calling as a leader, as a spiritual leader, you will go about doing that which God has called you to do and be successful at it. The first thing about a prophetic judge or a prophetic leader is this. When God has called you, your gift cannot be denied regardless of who you are. You know, I am a Jamaican man. As you can see, my skin is black. As you can see, I may not prototypically be the kind of guy that you would expect. When people hear I'm Jamaican, they're like, so where's your dreadlocks? Where's the reggae music? Where is that? There's this idea that people have in their minds concerning what I should be. And you know, I am always so surprised when I'm talking to people and they say, you know, you're so well-spoken. You know, you, you're not what I expected you to be. You know, you don't have the particular kind of approach that I would expect, and you are in a position of leadership that I would never expect. And you know what I say to that? I say, this is exactly one of the reasons why as a world and as a society, we are struggling so much. Because we have in our mind, in our thoughts, this idea of the way things should be. And when things step out of that, we don't know how to properly respond to it. Instead we say, but I thought that it should be this way. And so we can't appreciate when it is that way. This is the foundation for racism, classism, and all the things that we are struggling with as a society right now. It is the assumption that life should be a certain way. And guess what? We do that in order to box God in and to have a life that we can always predict the outcomes for. But you know what I love about God? God loves to rattle off the cage and change things. Why? Because he loves to show forth his power in doing things that are unusual so that people can say, wow, God is an amazing God. And I love that. I love it. You see, God walks straight into a patriarchal society, much more patriarchal than the one we live in. And he says, for the next judge, the next leader of this nation, I'm going to raise up a woman. A woman that is not in any kind, any way, shape, and form, a noble woman. A woman that doesn't necessarily have the background that you would expect in someone that rules. I'm just going to place within this woman the prophetic gift. And as I place within her the prophetic gift, the entire nation of Israel will come to see and understand it. And they will, as the word of God says here, they will go to her for counsel. Very unexpected in Israel. That a man would yield in terms of leadership to a woman. But when God has called you to purpose... When God has placed within you spiritual giftedness, nobody can stop it. It doesn't matter whether you are black or white. It doesn't matter whether you are a woman or a man. It doesn't matter what your background is. If God has placed within you giftedness, it will be recognized even by people who don't love you. People will see that there is something about you. There is something about you that inspires leadership and inspires people to want to follow an example. That is giftedness. You know, 
The Bible says in Romans chapter 11 verse 29, the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. In other words, if God has gifted you and God has called you to particular purpose, there is no man or woman or circumstance that can take away that calling and that giftedness. Why? Because it is about the performance that God desires to be accomplished in your life. It must be done if he has placed it within you. And people can discourage you all they want. People can say all they want about what you should or should not be. But when God's hand is upon you, nothing can stop you. Why? Because God's purposes have to be accomplished. And Deborah, the most unassuming person, she doesn't even have a throne or an office. She sits underneath a palm tree. And guess what? The people all over Israel are coming to that palm tree to hear the prophetic word of Deborah. Why? Because God put something in her that could not be denied. Let me tell you something, my friends. If God has placed his hand upon you for spiritual leadership, you don't have to be afraid of how he's going to use you. He has already placed within you that which is necessary for you to be not just respected, but to be followed and to be an inspiration to those who need inspiration. That, my friends, is the blessing of being a servant of God. All he needs from you is courage and availability, like we talked about last week. Because the giftedness cannot be denied. Can't be denied. You know, I'm sure there were many people who had negative things to say about Deborah. I'm sure there were many people who thought, this isn't what we're used to. This isn't usual. This isn't what we expect from our judges. But God is a God that will raise up anyone, anyone by his power to do his work. All he wants is availability and courage. The giftedness cannot be denied. And the entire nation of Israel saw it and came to her. You know, the only other person who had this kind of prophetic giftedness and was a blessing to the nation in the same way. Guess who his name was? His name was Moses. <laughs> Moses, the deliverer from Egypt, the one who Israel would come to with their issues and problems, and he would judge the people. God raised up a woman in the same lane as the great prophet Moses. Why? Because it doesn't matter that she's a woman. It matters that God invested in her the gift of prophecy. And the nation recognized it. And the people came to her. This wasn't your typical deliverer. But without Deborah, the nation would not have been delivered. You know, when I hear people say that women should be confined to particular areas of service within the church or within society, I really have to laugh out loud at that. Because every single one of us, whether you had a personal relationship with them, every single one of us has a mother. <laughs> yes. And our mothers, in terms of influence and care and compassion, generally speaking, there's hardly anyone more influential in our life than a mother. And more important to the development of a life than a mother. But I say this to you. When you begin to take gifts like that and put them into some vein that limits women in terms of their ability to be used by God, you're kind of fooling yourself. You know, in my experience as someone who not only served in church, but I grew up in church. Most of the women that inspired, most of the people that inspired me to serve God were women. The person who led me to the Lord was a woman. Most of the best sermons I've ever heard in my life have come from women. Most of the best teaching I've ever received in the scriptures have come from women. So when people say that they want to limit women in terms of the way that God can use them, it is a total misunderstanding of the context of scripture. Why? Because every single man of God in some way has been influenced and taught and brought up by some woman of God. 
That is my experience, and I'm sure the experience of many of us here. Listen, you can say all you want, but the giftedness cannot be denied. It can't be denied if it comes from God. And Deborah is the first example of a promise that God made to his people that he was going to pour out his spirit upon all flesh, upon your sons and your daughters, upon your male servants and your female servants. Why? Because God doesn't discriminate based on sex. God loves us all and we're all made in the image of God. So he can use anyone at any time for his purposes. The second thing there is this. If you're going to be a good and prophetic spiritual leader, you need to understand what you're called to do and what you are not called to do. You have to understand what you are called to do and what you are not called to do. Now let me say this. In the work of God, there is always something to do. Even in a church like this, there is so much to do and so little hands to do it. There are so many things that must be done or should be done, but there's a limitation of resources. Now, just because something needs to be done doesn't mean that you are called to do it. And this is something I've had to learn in ministry. I have to learn what it is that God has called me to do, not just what it is that I am able to do. You know why there's a lot of burnout in churches and why people many times walk away from ministry and don't desire to serve? It is because instead of doing what they are called to do, they just are doing whatever it is that they can do. But God doesn't call us just to do what we can do. God calls us to do what it is that he has called us to do. Pastor, how do I know what God has called me to do? Well, good question. You have to walk with God. That is why in this church, I don't talk about just leadership in an abstract. I talk continuously and maybe to the point of annoyance about spiritual leadership. Why? Because spiritual leadership is different. Spiritual leadership is about your walk with God and how that walk with God in turn informs what you do. That's different from someone who is just available to do whatever it is that needs to be done. That's different. One is volunteerism, one is spiritual leadership. Because one understands what God has placed in your life to give to the people of God and to bless the nation. Whereas the other one is done even by people who are not saved. Volunteerism is a good thing. But in the church of Jesus Christ, spiritual leadership is much more important. Because spiritual leadership has to do with hearing the voice of God and obeying God's voice in what it is we should do. And that is something that only comes as you walk with God. You cannot understand what it is that God has called you to do if you don't walk with God. If you don't have a vital, living relationship with God that affects your daily life, you cannot know what it is that he wants you to do. And this has nothing to do with age. It has nothing to do with gender. It has everything to do with the mindset you have about your faith. If your faith is not living and vital and impacting your daily life, none of these things about spiritual leadership are going to matter or have any effect on your life. But if God means to you what he should mean to you, then hearing his voice and receiving his guidance in your life is going to be of premium importance. And it's going to be especially necessary for the working of God to be accomplished where he has placed you. She understands what she's called to do. She's not called to be a warrior. She's called to raise up the warrior. The Bible says in this portion of scripture, in verse 6, she sent and summoned Barak, the son of Abinom, from Kadesh Naphtali, and said to him, Has not the Lord, the God of Israel, commanded you, Go 
gather the men at Mount Tabor, taking 10,000 from the people of Naphtali and the people of Zebulon. So she's not the warrior, but she is called to raise up the warrior. She is called to get Barak, the one who God has commissioned to deliver the people. She's called to call him up. Now that's hard for a lot of leaders. You see, for some people, you can't lead unless in the end you get the accolades. I want to be the one who knows the will of God, but I also want to be the one who does it, and in the one who in the end gets the plaque, the one who in the end gets the pat on the back, the one who is the one who delivers everyone. And if I can't be that person, then I don't want to even serve. Does this in any way sound familiar? There are so many people who mimic their idea of leadership on only the people who are getting the accolades. And if they can't get the accolades, they don't want to serve. But oh my friend, that is leadership that doesn't understand the importance of spirituality. You see, we don't serve to get the accolades. We don't serve so that people can say, you did so awesomely, Andrew. You, I enjoyed this, Andrew. No, we serve for the commendation of God. And if we serve for the commendation of God, then it is about knowing what he wants me to do and discharging that duty that is of paramount importance to the spiritual leader. If I can go home after church knowing that God told me to give this message and I gave it in faithfulness in a way that honors God, I can go to sleep happily and peacefully. Why? Because if I get his commendation, that is all I need. And whatever he's going to use his word to accomplish, he will do so. But my job, is to faithfully discharge what he has called me to do. That's what's most important. They understand what they're called to do and what they're not called to do. Deborah knew she was not called to fight, but she was called to raise up Barak, who was going to fight. She was called to be an encouragement and inspiration to him so that God may use him to deliver Israel. What does that teach us? That Deborah is not interested in the accolades. That Deborah is not trying to be the one like Shamgar and Ehud and Othniel, who is the one walking back from warfare, having delivered the people. No, she is a facilitator of the deliverance of Israel by being the prophet that God called her to be. Do you know your role? Do you know what God has called you to do? Are you doing it as unto God? Or are you doing it for accolades? If you're doing it for accolades, I can guarantee it's not going to last. But if you're doing it for God, you're going to do it until God tells you you're not supposed to do it anymore. Why? Because it is about his thoughts, his ideas, and his ideals for his, for his servant. Doing it the way God wants you to do it. So the prophetic judge, their gift can't be denied. They understand what they're called to do and what they're not called to do. And thirdly and finally... The prophetic judge, more than anyone, believes in what God says and not what people think. If you go down to verse 12 of this same chapter, she goes up with Barak. They come up, they get the forces from Naphtali and from Zebulon. And now they are going up to fight against Sisera, the general of the Canaanite army. And as they're going up, what happens? is what has always happened over the last 20 years. He gets his forces, Sisera, and he gets these 900 iron chariots, and they are now coming against Israel's army. Now remember, up to this point, every time Israel has gone up against Sisera, with his 900 iron chariots, they have been sent scrambling. They have lost. And so I can imagine as Barak is going up and he sees the 900 iron chariots, he's thinking to himself, we're going to be defeated again. We're going to be defeated again. But what does Deborah say? 
In verse 14, she says to Barak, Go up, for this day is the day in which the Lord has given Sisera into your hand. Does not the Lord go out before you? You see, the prophet or the prophetess sees things that the average person doesn't see. You know, people say, well, pastor, you know, we tried this. Or leader, we tried that. And it didn't work before. So what makes you think it's going to work now? Or we don't know what it is that God wants us to do. How do we know that if we do this, it's going to work out well? Well, that's the role of the prophet. The prophet is the one who believes in the word of God, regardless of what is impressionable and seen. Why? Because the prophet doesn't walk by sight. The prophet walks by faith, believing in God and in God's ability to do all things. And the prophet's role is to inspire people to that same belief. You say, oh, pastor, I don't know. You know, uh, we still have to be practical in our thoughts about what will and will not work within a circumstance. Let me say this, my friend. Spiritual leadership is about allowing God to rule and reign and to do his work. Wherever there is spiritual leadership, there is always hope. Why? Because a true spiritual leader knows and believes that God can do all things and can change any circumstance that we find ourselves in. And if that is true, that hope that that spiritual leader has will be contagious amongst those who may doubt it. Barak is going up and he's doubting, he's getting nervous. But Deborah says to him, keep on going up. Go up. Why? Because God has given them into our hands. And also, don't you know that God goes before us to fight for us? Let me say this. In the church of Jesus Christ, most of the victories that are won are not won up in the open. They are won in the hearts of people. And they are not won by the pastor convincing anybody or the lay people convincing anyone. It is one as God fights battles within the heart to convince people not to be nominal, not to be just in general about their faith, but to take their faith seriously and to walk with him. And as God wins those victories in the hearts of his people, the victory against the enemy in general is halfway won. Because winning in the heart, getting people to believe in God as more than just someone you come to talk to on a Sunday morning, that, my friends, is the real victory of the church when people begin to believe that God is greater than their problems, that God should be involved in every decision I make, that God is interested not just in churchy things, but in life things. That victory is the primary victory of the spiritual leader to inspire people to believe in more than what they see, to believe in a God that is at work regardless of what is going on around us. Are you that kind of leader? When people talk to you, do they believe that God can help them or do they feel less prone to believe in God? Well, if not, and you're not a spiritual leader. Spiritual leaders point people and inspire people to believe in things that cannot be seen. Faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And a spiritual leader teaches people to believe in God like that. And when you see a miracle, not to say, oh, well, that was good luck. No, we don't believe in that. We believe in a God who does things. So it's not luck, it's God. It's God. A spiritual leader believes what God says. And Deborah believed even before the warrior Barak believed. A good reminder that a good spiritual leader will help even the people who fight the battles. He, will, he or she will help those people in their times when they're not feeling strong enough to fight. That's a good leader. It's a good leader. Do I get discouraged sometimes? Absolutely. Even as a pastor, sometimes I wish somebody would say, hey, pastor, yeah, we can do this. God is working. God will do his thing. 
I get discouraged too sometimes. And that's why I love the prophetic people, people who are able to see what God sees and are able to come alongside and say, hey, we're doing this God's way and God will bless us. God will help us. I'll conclude with this. In her person and in her prophetic role, Deborah changed many things. She was not the leader that people were used to. She was not the prototypical leader whose goal was to be the star of the show and to get the accolades for the victory. She was raised up once again to show that God can use anyone he chooses for his divine purposes and to remind us in a practical way of Galatians chapter 3 verse 28 which says, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ, you have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, but you are all one in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. That, my friends, has been the story of God and his people from Old Testament to New Testament. Don't let anybody tell you that, Jesus, that God is chauvinistic. There's no way. God has been teaching his people ever since Deborah. It doesn't matter whether you are male or female. If I put my spirit within you and if I have gifted you, you can be used by me. And I will use you to deliver my people. Funnily enough, the more things change, the more things tend to stay the same. We're seeing another wave of patriarchal affirmation happening, even in our church, in our churches, in society. Almost like the marginalization of women for the sake of particular men to have power. Let me say this. It is stupid, literally stupid, to believe that in order to be a leader, you must marginalize other people who are made in the image of God, whether they are women or of another race or whatever it might be. God has made us all in his image and God has gifted us all. It doesn't matter where you're from. It doesn't matter your level of education. If you're a child of God, you're a part of something different. And that means, my friend, we must open our minds and our hearts to how God does things, not the way that we think of things, not the way we've done things, but to God's way of doing things. And that, my friends, is all-inclusive. It's not even a debate to me. God can and does use anyone who is his. And Deborah is a primary example of that. The prophetess Deborah was sent to deliver Israel. And she did. We know the story. And I'll finish up the story next week looking at the other judge, Barak, because it took a special kind of man to follow Deborah. You see, not many men would be able to fall into the position that Barak was in. Because this woman is guiding him and telling him what God's will is. And he has to submit to her. And you know us men, we struggle with that. We don't like to submit to anybody. <laughs> But he does it, why? Because he is a righteous man. You see, righteous men don't need to affirm their manhood. Righteous men can just follow God and they are okay with it. They're okay and secure. Why? Because they love God more than they love themselves. And Barak is a good man. And we'll talk more about that next week. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this word. Thank you for your truth. Pray, Lord God, we would learn from Deborah the power of your word. We would learn from Deborah the prophetic giftedness is something very special that the church needs. I pray that all prophets under the sound of my voice will speak the truth of God unashamed and unafraid. And I pray, Lord God, you will use their prophetic word as an inspiration to us as we seek to accomplish your will. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank <laughs> you.